we have to remind ourselves this is sacred history now and a lot of people have paid pretty heavy prices the same as you do in every civil rights movement hi there <laughs> my name is Dr. Jalen Ricks and I am the director and producer of uh, co-producer of uh, Lewd and Lascivious and this video is to give you a little bit of the behind the scenes how this movie came together how it happened and some interesting little tidbits that did not make it into the film itself way back in uh, let's see around 2000 I started my graduate studies at the Institute of Advanced Studies of Human Sexuality in San Francisco and on the very first day I had a professor, a gay professor, he kind of zeroed me in because I was the only gay student that trimester, and uh, we started talking, and he started telling me stories about the early civil rights of gays and lesbians and transgender people in the 60s, 50s, in San Francisco. And he told me this one story about a dance that happened around 1965, and after he was done with the story, I said, wow! That is such a great story. Why haven't I heard that before? And uh, throughout my graduate studies, throughout the several years it took me to get my degree, I would hear other people at the Institute tell this story. People, eyewitnesses of people who had been there at the uh, 1965 dance police raid. It was kind of called the 1965 police raid on California Hall. And uh, other professors would talk about it every time. Students would say, wow, why haven't we heard this story before? It's great. And so I had the amazing honor that by the time I started figuring out what my dissertation would be, I got to be able to do the research on this event as part of my doctorate of education, as my dissertation. And um, uh, I got my notes here, so I have to make sure I remember everything I want to say. <laughs> and... Um, um, it was, uh, I was really lucky that in 2006, I looked around at uh, the people who, um, um, uh, who had been there. I kind of did a search, and uh, I found about a dozen eyewitnesses of people who were actually at the dance. And I really lucked out because I, had, I found a good number of people who were the instigators, the, guy, the people that actually kind of organized and planned the whole event, a good number of them were still alive, still kicking. They're all characters, right? They all had personalities. So I thought, this is great. This is going to be wonderful. So we, I had kind of just started out kind of doing research on it, but I knew that it would be a good idea to at least videotape them. So we set up cameras and, and, and videotaped their stories. And as we moved along through researching the whole story, it became pretty evident that even though I was going to do research enough to maybe write a book, it would be even better as a documentary. So, uh, and I think it's really, really wonderful because we have kind of reached a point, you know, decades have gone by in this civil rights movement that a lot of the people who started it, they aren't around too much longer. In fact, a lot of them have, have passed. And it is true, you know, now here, I'm making this video in 2007, and um, I believe about you know, uh, several of the people that were in the film are no longer with us. So it is, you know, this is, to me, this is historic gold that we get to have them on video. And, um, you know, uh, families and organizations, they have historical organizations, they have a whole system of how to, you know, kind of create history and, and tell stories about their ancestors and things like that. Sometimes, though, minority and oppressed groups don't always record their information because they were not connected like an LGBT community. We're not connected uh, by family. We are connected by choice. We choose to be together. Sometimes what that means is some of our history gets lost in the past. So it's really important that we put down this information that we make records of our history and all the great things that we've done. Um, I think something that really makes this story unique and stand out is um, that uh, 
the main instigators, the ones that really got this this whole event going, were straight ministers. Straight ministers? What? That was just so refreshing that um, they didn't care if they were gay or lesbian or transgender, didn't matter. They saw firsthand the abuse that was going on and the injustice that was happening, and they knew to be on the side of justice. Ah, oh, that is so refreshing. It is so different than a lot of the conservative right-wing fundamentalist attitude that really doesn't emulate true acceptance or justice or doesn't even emulate the unconditional love of God that we see a lot today. And it just, it, I think that's why the story stands out so nicely because these are straight Christians that are doing what they know to be right in the eyes of God and they just did it. It didn't matter. And it created such an amazing story. Um, I think also the story, um, you know, and, and the circumstances involved, it just lays out, it's almost kind of a, a spontaneous recipe for a perfect civil disobedient experience, right? You know, they had their lawyers there. They they made sure that all the different groups were unified, right? That was the first time any of those groups ever talked to each other at all. And they just somehow they lined up the circumstances just right so that everything was taken care of. They had that press conference at the right moment. I mean, everything lined up to make kind of this, you could almost use the story like a like a um, uh, an experiment in civil disobedience gone right, right? You know, even even with the fear and people getting arrested, it all worked out in the end. They kind of had done it all the right way. And I think it's a really great example of how civil disobedience can be interesting and exciting and uh, um, inspiring and can change a society and can be totally fabulous all at the same time. It's wonderful. Um, one thing that I really learned in doing this is, and, and you've probably heard some things like this before, but um, it, is, it, it is just a, a, a part of history that when you tell stories and time passes, those stories change. Those stories kind of morph into kind of um, what we need them to be. And uh, there was one particular aspect of, of this story. I wanted to somehow get it into the video itself, but it was, it was so complicated, I just really didn't feel like we had the time, or it really wasn't part of the key story. And that was when I first started filming, the, um, the, um, there was a story floating around that the two guys that were arrested in the dance for dancing with each other, that they had not been dancing at all. In fact, they were putting up decorations, and one was kind of holding the other one up so that he could put up decorations, and the police came in, and because those two guys were dancing, or because they were too touching, putting up decorations, they got arrested. And I thought that was part of the story. I, that's the way I'd heard the story um, all along, and I even had footage of different members of the documentary saying just that. Oh, and they weren't dancing at all. They were just putting up decorations. And then the police came in and arrested them for putting up decorations. Well, I was talking with John Borsett. He was one of the dance, one of the guys that got arrested at dancing. And he said, actually, that didn't happen at all. Actually, they were dancing. They were dancing together. And the police came in and, and took them out, just like he said. What had happened, though, when they when their court case went to um, to court when their case went to court um, the lawyers were too afraid that they would lose they were they were sure that um, the jury would find them guilty because they were dancing together and that was basically against the law and so the lawyers had coached John and his friend to make up a story about that they weren't dancing, they were putting up decorations. And that's why in the movie, I don't know if you notice, there's a point where John says, 
you know that we had to get up in you know we had to get up there and sit in the chair and we had to tell our version of the story ha 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 and he kind of chuckles that's what he's referring to and it's interesting because i told i told some of the other people like like Del Martin and Phyllis i said you know that that actually didn't happen oh my and they did not believe me one minute i'm like no really it didn't happen she's like well okay that's right okay whatever but <laughs> um it is fascinating that that as time goes by, these legends and stories morph and change. And that's why it's so important that we get information like this down and, and we, we tell our stories and we, and we find the stories that mean m the most to us and we get those stories out there. It's so important. So thanks for listening. Those are a few little tidbits. And uh, there's so much I could talk about that, that important um, uh, time in my life in making this film, and it was really wonderful. Thank you for listening, and uh, thanks for watching Lude and Lascivious. Bye-bye.